We need to alleviate world hunger. So when did they come up with this idea? I'm sure it came up way before this time because back in the Nikita Khrushchev regime, they, uh, they killed uh, 7 to 9 million people in the Ukraine uh, under his regime. We didn't hear a word about it. That's, Ukraine, by the way, is the breadbasket of Russia. Uh, they starved them to death within a 12-month period. Here, here Kissinger said you control the, people's, control the people's food, you control the people. This was back in 1974 that he started telling us that. We're starting to see in the newspaper articles, this one's 1996, it says uh, the current crisis is nothing compared to the coming food shortage. The current crisis might be the oil crisis, the things we've had in the past. When we have food, people, there's going to be problems in, in this country when there's no food, I mean. Uh, so they're starting to tell us about this. I don't know whether you had the blackouts. We had blackouts in seven or eight states in the West. I don't know the exact number, but it was close to, I know it was at least seven, maybe eight states. What happens when a blackout comes well, for a three-day period of time? Three day period of time? First of all, your refrigerator shuts off and all the food goes bad that's in the refrigerator. Secondly, it takes three days to turn over the food supplies in a, in a, grocery, a typical grocery store. In case of emergency, it takes three hours. I would not, men, send your wife to the grocery store to get food in case of an emergency because she probably, she, I know she wouldn't come back with food and she probably wouldn't come back. Also, what happens in a blackout, you don't, you're not be able to go to the bank and get money, you're not able to go get gas from the gas pumps. Uh, you're totally under the control of these people when they shut the electricity off. Uh, I understand now there's one to two um, uh, mega corporations that, own, that control the electricity supplies all throughout the country. Uh, it's an excellent way, again, to bring people to their knees and, and force them to go to these places where, where you have to uh, uh, obey their rules or not receive food for your family. Right here is another uh, article out of the LA Times that says initial signs of food shortages. That was 1974. Uh, here's one in 1976, November. Emptier silos mean grim food. They should say empty silos mean grim food. It says that uh, they held this five-day World Food Summit, again, a UN summit in Rome of November of last year. Uh, they were deciding who's going to get what food and when they're going to get it uh, and how they're going to bring these people, how they're going to bring this world to their knees. Uh, David Armstrong said this last year, uh, April 20th. He says, we're looking at a good, very good chance of empty bins for the first time. There's a chance we may actually run out of corn or wheat. Most of this food has been shipped over to Russia and to China. Many of them have. We used to have seven years supply in all our, in all our granaries and all our silos and stuff. We now have maybe a week, maybe two weeks. Who knows? We hear all kinds of reports, but I know we don't have seven years. I do. I have heard that Russia and China are most favored nations, uh, trading status customers. They are cut. Or yeah, most favored nation, uh, most favored trading nations have five to seven years food in their silos. This is what happens in Bosnia when the food's taken away from the people. They're at the mercy of the, it says, the insiders, machinations. That's just their evil desires. You have to go there to get the rice or whatever they give you for your family that day. Uh, it's amazing to me out in California that the people are not prepared in case of an earthquake. They could care less. They don't believe it's going to happen to them. I guess it's a typical American's way of thinking. It can't happen to us. We're Americans. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, we could have a, we could have a major earthquake and, those, and that whole area is shut down and nobody, everybody would be at, the, be at the mercy of the insiders' machinations. We'd have to go to those places to collect because nobody is prepared in case of emergency with food and water uh, as well as medical supplies. And they've been telling us to do this and yet nobody's done it. There's other, other emergencies that could happen back here would require the same thing, i.e. blackout of, of electricity. Uh, let's look at this permanent lasting peace that they plan on bringing about and bringing this new millennium in with peace and, and safety. They know they have a problem with the American people. The American people have never been in slavery. At least they never thought they were in slavery. We are through, the, through our indebtedness. But we, we still feel like we're not because we don't see anybody in chains. We don't see people tied up. We don't see them going to prison. We think we have this all this freedom and liberty. But really we are, we are enslaved, just the very debt we owe. But right here, they want to get the guns away from the people. This was passed by President Kennedy in 1961. There's two, two uh, State Department uh, manuals there. One is Freedom from War. One's a blueprint from, the, from a peace race. Let's look at this one that he signed, the State Department manual. And you can get these any, any place you want. It's by Kennedy in 1961. Here's what it basically says in a real simple form. They have a three-stage program to disarm uh, America. They want to have, first of all, really the world, They'll have two, uh, uh, a mutual destruction 
powers, the Russia and U.S. will have this Cold War and we're always at odds with one another. The U.N. will become very small. We're in stage three where we have no military. And, and most of the Russian military has been integrated into the U.N. Uh, peacekeeping forces, they call it. On May 3rd, 1994, I just said we have no military. Let's look at this. May 3rd, 1994, here's one of these presidential decision directives. That's the same as executive order. Same as a presidential mandate, they're all the same, synonymous. He writes the laws. They go before the register for 60 days. If they aren't, if they aren't uh, challenged at that point, uh, uh, they, uh, they're considered law. And they're on the books. Anyway, on May 3, 1994, Clinton signed Presidential Decision Directive 25 and then declared it classified. That's the word I was looking for earlier, classified. He has, I have, you'll see in a little while, 12 pages of just the headings. This would say PDD 25 just the headings of 12 pages of executive orders that President Clinton passed, and that, that does not include the ones that are classified, because we will never see what those ones that are classified are. In fact, Congress wasn't going to see this one. If you know anything about Michael New, this is what happened to him. They used pre Presidential Decision Directive 25 to say that he was, uh, you know, he was supposed to be in a, a UN uniform, and, and he was court-martialed and found guilty. Uh, and uh, Anyway, it says, uh, it says he offered only a the, the, Anyway, Congress wanted to know what this was all about. So the president offered them a brief outline is all he did. But in that brief outline, the summary stated that during the times of national emergency, complete command and control of the United States military will pass, will pass from him to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Now, that's not America as we know it. That's a group of internationalists. That's a group of people from all over the world. They're all united, as you'll see in just a little while. You'll see what a fascist symbol is all about. It's a whole bunch of rods united together in a fascist government. Uh, we need some kind of world army if we're gonna if we're gonna have this peace and security here. Reagan talked about the world army. Bush talked about the world army, and, and Clinton approves UN army. Uh, in fact, in the L.A. Times out there, this was right on the, on the Sunday uh, center of one of the uh, one of the center full handouts of the paper there in the L.A. Times. It said, "Soldiers of the New World Order." So again, it isn't that they aren't telling us what's happening; they're telling us we're just not paying attention. These are some of the uh, some of the armor personnel carriers they have. Uh, you'll see them all over. Uh, I know we have some militia members here tonight. I, I can guarantee, I just praise God for their, uh, their desire to defend their families, for their desire to stand up for, for the way they believe. I personally well, would much rather have a nine-foot angel with a flaming sword standing beside me than have, a, than have a, a bazooka. But if I'm called, if I'm ever called to defend my family, I will, I promise you. It's just hearing God's voice. Many people say, well, should I go to Colorado and hide in a cave someplace? I said, yes, if that's what God tells you to do. Somebody said, should I join the militia and get my guns and bazookas and everything ready? I say, yes, if that's what God's called you to do. But do what he's told you to do. I personally, in case of anarchy, that's one of the big, I live in one of the big cities. In case of anarchy, I will not let these gangs rape and destroy my family. They're going to come over my dead body. They will, not, they will not hurt my girls in front of me. I will be dead before they start having fun with my girls playing sport with them. But I can guarantee you, if it's, an, if it's, a, if it's a, uh, a tank out in front of my house with a Stinger missile pointed at my house, I probably will get on my knees and I'll ask the Lord what I should do. I will ask him to give me the strength to maintain wherever I may be going so I could share the gospel with one more person. It may be on a truck to be, to be sent home to be with him. It may be on a way to a camp. But I'll trust in him at that point because I know what a Stinger missile does to a house. You people can see what happened to the, to the Branch Davidians that, had their, that, that didn't have the air cover, that didn't have anywhere near, and they didn't bring in any power firepower at that point. They brought in just a very small show of firepower, a few tanks, and, and a couple of helicopters. Well, you saw what they did in Desert Storm. These people have tremendous firepower capabilities. It would almost be suicide. You're, you're just signing your own note if you think you're going to take them on. Now, I know some of the militias of other parts of the country. They're going to work in core groups. They're going to move throughout the forest. They're going to move just as they did in, in, in uh, uh, Afghanistan. They're going to hit in little groups, little cores, and that's fine if that's the way they're going to do it. 
Uh, they'll probably be able to take some people out, but they won't be able to defend their families. And, and I know it won't work in a ma major metropolitan area the way it, where I live today, because they have technology today that would just blow your mind. That we didn't get to see the initial video, but in the initial video, President uh, uh, Clinton talked about the the uh, technology that is magical. Well, let me tell you what, you'll see a little bit of it in a few minutes. It is magical. 